Good morning, Farrell and Amelon's Corps, and welcome back to episode two. My name is Jonathan Barr, and this time we're going to be taking a deeper dive into shock. Before we move on, I'm just going to pause a minute for you to read this uh, disclaimer here. All right. And I, again, I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose about any of the topics I'll be talking about today. So what are we going to get into today? First, we're going to review what shock actually is. We're going to go over four main types of shock, and then we'll integrate what we previously learned about vital signs. So we're going to have a little bit of throwback, so hopefully you remember what we talked about in episode one, and then we'll discuss kind of what your initial management is going to be in the pre-hospital setting. So first of all, what is shock? So when we talk about shock, what I want you to think about is this car driving towards the edge of the cliff. Shock is basically a physiologic state that if you don't recognize it early enough, you're going to go right off the cliff. The patient's going to go right off the cliff. It's going to become irreversible and lead to death. But you're still on the ground there. There's a time to put on the brakes and hit reverse and get away from that edge. And it's contingent upon you recognizing and identifying shock states early. And we're going to go over how to do that. So first, I keep saying this term shock. What we're talking about here is physiologic shock, which is inadequate tissue perfusion. I'm going to say that again. Shock is inadequate tissue perfusion. What is tissue perfusion? Perfusion is getting oxygen and nutrients via the blood, in the blood, to the organs that need it. Okay? So a lot of times people think of shock as, as blood flow, but shock is also you need, you need the blood to bring the appropriate stuff. So it needs to have adequate oxygen and adequate nutrients getting to the tissues, which is all the different parts of your body, and the organs that need it. Okay? So how does the perfusion get there? So in order for the perfusion to get there, you need one, the heart or the pump to push it around. Two, you need the blood vessels or the pipes to transport it around, and three, you need to have to actually have enough blood in there to deliver it, to carry it around. Sometimes that's called the container function. So pump, pipes, and container. Now some people put these together into a triangle, and we call that the perfusion triangle. So you need these three things to get perfusion to your tissues. Now this brings us into the different types of shock, as different parts of that triangle get interrupted. So first, you could have problems with the pump. When you have a problem with the pump directly, aka the heart, that's called cardiogenic shock. So things that cause this would be things like a heart attack maybe, cardiomyopathy, arrhythmias. Sometimes there could be a mechanical problem with one of the valves, so valvular heart disease can lead to cardiogenic shock. And so that's the first way the pump can be affected. However, the pump can also be indirectly affected. So one of the issues you might have is that you might have fluid around the heart or fluid in the pericardial sac, which covers the heart. And that fluid can start compressing on the heart and lead to something called cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade obstructs blood flow getting out of the heart. Okay. Similarly, you can also have blood flow obstructed if you have a tension pneumothorax or collapsed lung. And when your lung is collapsed to such a degree that it starts to push on the heart and mediastinal structures, you can again obstruct blood outflow there. Now, you could also have it for large blood clots in the lungs, such as a pulmonary embolus. So if you look at this CAT scan here, you can see this gray part here. That's showing a large PE in the saddle area. Sometimes that's called a saddle pulmonary embolus. And when you have a massive pulmonary embolus, it's blocking blood flow out of the right ventricle, causing right heart strain and stopping blood flow from being delivered across into the lungs and out the other side on the left side. And so this is another potential form of obstructive shock. Remember, these all involve an obstruction of the pump. Now, notice how they all start with T. Some of you 
uh, might have heard of the H's and T's in cardiac arrest to help identify reversible causes, well, these are three of them here, and they lead to an obstructive shock picture. Now, what about the next step? What about the pipes? So the problem that you can get with the delivery through the pipes is that often the pipes are not distributing the perfusion, aka the blood carrying nutrients and oxygen, to the correct spots. And usually that happens because of inappropriate vasodilation. Vasodilation means the blood vessel goes from small to big inappropriately and drops the blood pressure. So this can happen in septic shock, one of the most common types. It can also happen in anaphylactic shock. And it can also happen in something called neurogenic shock, which is not one that we think about often, but that can happen when there's a spinal cord injury and you can get this type of vasodilation that leads to distributive shock. Now, bonus points, this is just a stock photo from online, but bonus points if you put in the comments or write back to me with what are the things that are being done wrong in this administration of an EpiPen here. This is not the way I recommend you do it, and bonus points to anyone who can uh, write to me or comment with what the issues are in this, in this picture. Now lastly, we could also have a problem with what's in the pipes or the container, and when we have that, we call that hypovolemic shock. So one problem could be is that you're bleeding and there's not enough blood in the, in the pipes to transport around. That's a subset of hypovolemic shock, often called hemorrhagic shock, meaning you're bleeding out. Now you could also have hypovolemic shock because maybe you just don't have enough fluid because for example, you could be an elderly patient, maybe you have dementia and you, or you don't have access to water and so you get severely dehydrated and you don't have enough blood volume because you, have, you don't have enough fluid, you haven't been drinking enough over time and this can happen over a long time. That can also be hypovolemic shock. Now, I don't list it here explicitly, but something you should be aware of is that you could have the perfect amount of blood and the perfect amount of fluid and still have problems with the blood content. If that blood can't adequately deliver um, nutrients and oxygen to your cells. Bonus if you can write in the comments below about some, a problem with the blood itself that might prevent delivery of oxygen or nutrients that is not due to low blood or low fluid volume. So that'll be a little uh, brain teaser for you guys. Hopefully you can uh, write me back some some guesses as to what that might be. Okay, so key critical steps here. The most critical step for you as an EMS provider, especially at the BLS level, is you need to be able to recognize shock when it's happening. You need to be able to determine when that car is driving towards the cliff edge. Now, how are we gonna do that? We're going to throw back a little bit to what we learned last time when we looked at vital signs. Remember, vital signs are vital. Vital signs that are abnormal in any way need to be addressed, and the heart rate is often the first clue. Sometimes in the early stages of shock, the only thing you're going to see is a little bit of a quick heart rate. And it can be subtle. It can be subtle in the beginning. And that's why every abnormal vital sign needs to be addressed. You need to think about why is my heart rate high? Why is my heart rate 105 or 110, right? It doesn't seem that crazy, but it's, it's telling you something is going on. So pay attention to the heart rate. Now, people like to throw up this chart here specifically for hemorrhagic shock. You know, this comes up on board exams and other tests and things like that. What I want you to get out of this is not necessarily the specifics of this chart. I mostly just want you to, to see what is in class two here. So in class two hemorrhagic shock, notice how you can have 15 to 30 percent loss of blood volume. It's a pretty good amount. You can lose almost a third of your blood. Your heart rate will start to quicken a little bit, but notice that the blood pressure stays normal. Again, I want to emphasize this point. I can't emphasize this enough. In the early stages of shock, you won't see any 
effect on your blood pressure. All you might see is a little quick heart rate. Now, for those of you who might remember from last week, there's another vital sign or, or little calculation we can do that can give you a clue, and that's the pulse pressure. And it's decreased or narrowed in hemorrhage. That can be another early clue that this patient's going into shock. Okay? And then lastly, I want to give you guys a little bit of advice. Look at this bottom row here. It's all talking about anxiousness. I point this out because when I talk to EMS providers and they tell me, oh, why, why is the, the what? I ask them, I say, hey, why do you think the heart rate is high? Some say, oh, he's just anxious. He's, he's upset he was in a car accident. Okay, maybe. But also remember, anxiousness can be a sign that the patient's going into early shock. So I would caution you to almost never Almost never make a diagnosis of anxiety in the pre-hospital setting. I'm going to say that again. Almost never should you make a diagnosis of anxiety in the pre-hospital setting. I'm going to say that one more time because I think it's really important. Almost never make a diagnosis of anxiety in the pre-hospital setting. I'm actually hard, having a hard time even thinking of a situation where you would do it, but it's going to be almost never. Okay? If the patient is anxious, this is telling you, it can be telling you that there's something going on in the body, okay? And you should take it seriously. And anxiety is kind of be a diagnosis of exclusion. And in the pre-hospital setting, you're not really able to exclude all those other life-threatening causes. You can exclude some, but not all. And so it's important that you take it seriously, especially if you see a little bit of quick heart rate, you see the pulse pressure is narrowing, you know, they were just in a car accident. Yeah, they might be a little amped up. Maybe it's a little adrenaline going. But also maybe they're losing blood somewhere that you just can't see. And it's important that you take this seriously and follow it up. Okay? And following it up may be notifying the patient. If they don't want to go to the hospital, follow up may be taking them to the hospital. Or maybe you just need to repeat these vitals in a few minutes and see if they're going up or they're going down. Remember, we talked about vital signs are one snapshot in time. Okay? It's only one time point. So you might need a second set to see which way the patient's going. So this is just a little refresher because we mentioned the narrowed pulse pressure can be an early clue. This is a reminder of how to calculate. It's just the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure, blood pressure. Okay. And if it's getting narrow, you should start to think about that hypovolemic shock. Now, if it's getting wide, it might be telling you that the patient has vasodilatory shock or distributive shock. So something to think about there it can help you in this setting as well. Now, for those of you who want a, a little bit of space repetition on some of the more advanced vital sign interpretation, you can remember you can also use the shock index, which can help you in hemorrhagic shock or, or in, in suspected hemorrhagic shock to kind of get a sense of how bad the shock is. So just remember that's your heart rate over, over systolic blood pressure. And the heart rate over diastolic blood pressure can give you a clue as to how bad the vasoplegic shock or the distributive shock is. Okay, so something to consider here. Again, these two things are more advanced concepts, um, and they're kind of like for the person who wants the next level thing. But I want everyone to know heart rate, okay, as a as an early clue. Now, you guys might remember uh, from last time we had a couple key vital sign patterns. Let's just go through them one by one. So look at pattern one. We see the heart rate's a little bit high. Blood pressure starting to get a little bit low. Respiratory rate 24, okay. Pulse pressure is narrowing here, right? We see them coming down on top of each other. It's systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So what do we think that might be? That's your hypovolemic shock patient. And remember, this person, because their blood pressure is already fallen, remember, they're already probably in stage 3 hemorrhagic shock, which is, remember, they've lost more than a third of their blood volume, maybe up to 40%. Okay, so remember that that's, that's a seriously sick patient. Let's look at pattern two, again, the same heart rate, but notice the difference in the blood pressure. Notice how low the diastolic blood pressure is. Okay, you see that the pulse pressure this time is wide. This is your patient in vasoplegic shock. That's another term basically saying that probably distributive shock or septic shock. It's basically telling you this is a shock where the blood vessels are too wide and they're not distributing the blood effectively. Okay. And what about, what about pattern three? It looks like we're a little tachycardic here. Blood pressure is pretty okay. Pulse pressure is uh, borderline, maybe a little narrow, but it's not too crazy. 
and that's your compensated shock. This is the patient who's in the car, who's driving towards the cliff, and you have time to put on that brakes, turn around, go in reverse, and stop this process. So I want you to recognize this early so that it can be addressed. Now, how might you address it? How you address it depends on the type of shock, okay? So the, if it's cardiogenic shock, remember the problem is with the pump. We need the pump to pump harder. How can you make the pump pump harder? One way is ALS can give a vasopressor, such as epinephrine. Remember, that that's a different epinephrine than the one you'd use for anaphylaxis, so I'm not saying you should use your EpiPens for this. Again, I'm not saying you should use your EpiPens for this, for cardiogenic shock, because it's a different uh, concentration of epi given a different route, but it is something that maybe you might need there. So you should weigh the risk benefit of uh, getting to the hospital versus an ALS intercept. The next one is obstructive shock. So the treatment to relieve obstructive shock is to relieve the obstruction. So if it's cardiac tamponade, for example, ALS can give some fluids to kind of slow the, the progress of that. Ultimately, they're going to need a physician to drain the effusion. And um, I've actually done this in the field in, uh, before, but if you don't have a doc, which most of the time you're not going to have a doc, uh, you need to get to an ER where there is a doc who can do this. If it's from tension pneumothorax, you might need a needle decompression. And that is something that is within the ALS skill set and the paramedic can do for you. That being said, if you're close to the hospital, sometimes the best thing is to kind of kind of uh, scoop and run, so to speak. So you're going to have to weigh the benefit of where you are, where ALS is, and where the hospital is. Now, distributive shock. Well, if the problem is distributing, well, we need to redistribute then. So if, we, if we're redistributing inappropriately because the blood vessel is too wide, we need something that's going to squeeze the blood vessel down. And so that's where ALS can come in, and you may need a vasopressor. Now, you can affect one type of this. Remember, if it's anaphylactic shock, you have EpiPens, you can start to treat this. Okay? So if it is anaphylaxis, you can go ahead with your EpiPen. If it's anything else, like septic shock or neurogenic shock, the Epi you have is not the right Epi for that. Okay? It's a different kind of Epi that you need. It's not the right concentration. Okay? But ALS has Epi, and so you could, you could uh, consider an ALS intercept there. Okay? Um, fluids can sometimes help with distributive shock uh, by filling up the tank some more and helping blood get to the um, areas it needs to get to, even if the, the blood vessels are a little dilated. So that's another option there, another ALS intervention. And then in hypovolemic shock, particularly hemorrhagic shock, this is where you have the biggest role to play. Stop the bleeding. And we could talk about techniques for bleeding control in another session. But you as BLS providers should be experts at stopping bleeding, at pressure, at elevation, at tourniquets. You should be experts on this. And in many trauma cases, the best thing you can do is just take these patients to the hospital. There's relatively little ALS can offer many of these patients. Um, there are some exceptions uh, if the patient has an airway issue or something like that. But for the most part, trauma is going to be mostly BLS skills. Okay, and this is where you guys can shine and where you guys can control that bleeding and get that patient to the hospital. Okay, in all cases, you want to think about treating the underlying cause. And in all cases, remember, if the patient's in shock or you think they're in shock, they need to get to the hospital. Okay, this is a serious condition. We're running towards the cliff edge here and we need to turn it around. And you have some tools at your disposal, but you don't have enough most of the time and you need more tools. So you need to get somewhere that does. Okay, so get these patients off to the hospital. So let's summarize where we're at here. So shock is the physiologic state with inadequate tissue perfusion. Remember, it's all about the perfusion. And remember, that perfusion depends on the pumps, pipes, and the container function of what's in there. Okay, that can also be characterized as cardiogenic, obstructive, distributive or hypovolemic and the vital signs again are what help you recognize shock early and I want you guys to understand that shock is life-threatening and if you recognize it early as an EMS provider you can really help save some lives okay because if you don't recognize it early it could be too late they could already be off the cliff and into irreversible shock so you really really I can't emphasize enough the early recognition is key in this and that's where you guys can come in so
Um, please uh, send me any questions. You can comment down below or email me or uh, send them through Lori and Chris. And uh, stay safe out there, guys. See you on the next one. MD4 out.